Welcome to another West Main Worship Bite. In this week's lesson, I want to explore a question or a struggle that I think many of us in the faith will face one time or another in our walk with Christ. And it's the idea of assurance of our salvation. How can we have confidence and joy that our salvation is secure? So often, we doubt our salvation. And it's a strange thing. Why would many of us experience doubt and a lack of assurance about our salvation? I know, speaking for myself, that I have often doubted my salvation, especially in my younger years in the faith. I would often learn something new about Christ, and then I would think to myself, well, I didn't know this you know, before I was baptized last time, so because I know it now, I, I probably really should be truly baptized this time. Or more likely, especially in my younger years, I would end up sinning, doing things I knew I ought not to do, and so I would question my salvation. I would think, well, if I really repented of my sins, I wouldn't have done these things. If I really believed that Jesus Christ was Lord, I wouldn't have given into temptation so easily. And so I'd be baptized again. And then I can remember, even after I went off to Sunset School of Preaching and started learning things again, I would come out of certain classes and I would just be blown away by the things I was learning. I was just gaining in depth and understanding and being more convicted about the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel and my sin. And I can remember several times I would go for walks in the evening and I would try to process all these things I was learning in school. And I would think, I, I don't know if I really understood the resurrection. I mean, I, I've heard all these proofs of the resurrection now and I was so convicted it made me wonder, did I really believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Maybe I didn't. So, well, not as fully as I thought I did, or not as convinced as I ought to have been. So could I have really confessed Jesus as Lord if I really didn't understand how he was raised from the dead, that he really truly was alive and well? Did my conviction mean that there was some part of me, somewhere in my mind, somewhere in my heart, that I really didn't believe? And so I would baptize myself because, honestly, I was embarrassed to tell anybody else. I didn't want to be rebaptized by someone else because then they would know how doubtful I am and how uncertain I, I was. So I'd always sneak into church buildings at night and would go and baptize myself just to reassure myself that I wasn't lost. So in many ways, I was really the doubting Thomas of salvation when it came to assurance. And that's not something good. Unlike that song, Blessed Assurance, I would sing blessed assurance or maybe not so sure. So I would rewrite the lines this way. Blessed assurance. Some days I'm not so sure. Jesus is mine? Oh, what a foretaste, I hope, of glory divine. Heir of salvation? I think. Purchase of God? So they tell me. Born of the Spirit? Whatever that means. Washed in his blood? It's my fault he had to die. This is my story, most days. This is my song, sometimes. Praising my Savior all day long when I feel worthy, which is rare. I think many of us could sing that song. But when we begin to doubt, when we begin to doubt our assurance in Christ, there is a cost to pay for that doubt. I think it's a lack of assurance of salvation leads to not really being free to serve and experience unbridled joy. In other words, I'm not really free to just serve the Lord because I'm so ridden with guilt or doubt or shame that I really don't run free with the Lord and just feel like I could do anything with God because most of the time, because I'm doubting my salvation, doubting I have this assurance, I feel like I'm just sort of doing these good works so I can prove to God that I really am worthy of his love, that I really do love him. And so there really is no freedom to serve. I'm really serving to try to prove that I really am devoted to the Lord. And when you're trying to serve the Lord just to prove yourself, there's not much joy left in that. So it raises a question I think all of us have at one time or another. What is making us sick 
with a lack of salvation assurance? What is plaguing us and robbing us, costing us this joy in salvation and in Jesus Christ we ought to have? Well, I think the virus of lack of assurance can often come and infect us in the following ways. This is just some of the ways. You might come up with some more, but these are some that I can think of that infect us and rob us of this confident assurance we ought to have. For example, blunting the gospel of the love of God. In other words, we're not really understanding just how loved by God we really are. We know it, but we don't necessarily put an emphasis on it. Or sometimes then we turn inward for assurance. In other words, we think about what is the quality of my thoughts, my emotions, my beliefs. Am I doing enough? It's an inward look at my own efforts. I'm trusting in my own efforts. I've repented well enough. I believe well enough. I, I'm doing enough uh, good works. I'm, I'm participating in church ministries. And sometimes we stress our free will choice and efforts then. Well, I'm smart enough. I, I made the choice. The gospel was presented to me, and I believed, and I made the choice. And so the emphasis is on what I have chosen. My identity really becomes I made a decision for Jesus. And many people preach the gospel that way. Make a decision for Jesus today. You know, you've got to make the decision. You've got to make the choice. And so we put a confidence really in our own ability to make that choice. Some lose their confidence ultimately because they're really offended by unconditional grace. I really think that's the big one myself. The idea that we contribute nothing to our salvation, that it's all achieved in Jesus Christ, I think really is an affront, an offense to our human pride. Sometimes we substitute what I would call a legal understanding for a love understanding of our relationship with Jesus. Now, I'm going to unpack that a little more in the following slide and explain that. But what I mean by a legal understanding, it's the idea that I'm fulfilling a contract. There's a legal contract between God and I. And he kind of lays out the terms, tells me what I have to do. And then I fulfill my end of the contract. And because I do my contribution, as small as it might even be, Legally, then, God is obligated to forgive me and have a relationship with me. So a legal understanding is sort of like a, a, a contractual agreement. God does this, I do that. God does X, I do Y. And so some of us are believing, and this is a terrible virus, that God somehow is coerced or convinced or compelled legally into loving us. Now, that legal understanding of assurance uh, really is a killer to the confidence we could have in Jesus Christ. When you have a legal understanding, the emphasis will be on how right you're doing it. How good are you fulfilling the contract, the covenant with God? Did you hear it right legally? Did you hear the right words, the right doctrines? Are you legally believing, believing in the right way? in the right doctrines? Are you repenting correctly, confessing correctly? Are you being baptized, quote, for the right reasons? Because the contract has to spell it out legally. And so some people have to you know, concentrate on how well they're fulfilling the legal obligations of the gospel. Now that's what we've done, and I think, in the restoration movement. Other uh, denominations uh, practice what they call the four spiritual laws. You know, and so they have to obey those correctly. That really is a legal understanding. Some charismatic or Pentecostal folks will talk about, well, did you experience the second outpouring of the Spirit by speaking in tongues? So really, again, it's sort of like looking for a legal uh, experience. Well, if I did it right, then I should have, quote, this experience. Did I legally do this correctly? So if we put you on trial, put you on the stand, could we legally make the argument that you are a Christian. Now, all that is going to infect you with a lack of confidence in your assurance of salvation. So it raises a question. What is the prescription for treating a lack of salvation assurance? 
How can we be cured of this disease that robs us of so much? What I've been submitting to you in all these previous lessons that I've been sharing with you is that a cure for a lack of assurance is a true understanding of God. What he has achieved for us, what he has achieved for us in Jesus Christ. Now to get at what that means, I, I have to use a word that can help you with your confidence and your assurance and salvation. Now maybe you can come up with a different word. This word that I'm gonna use is not uncommon, but I don't think it's all that common either. And, and, but I, so I hesitate using it a little bit, but really it's a good word. So if you'll allow me just to use it, I'll explain it. And if you could come up with a better one, well then do so. But the word I want to use is this word, vicarious. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines vicarious as experienced as a result of watching, listening to, or reading about the activities of other people rather than by doing the activities yourself. So they give an example. She took a vicarious pleasure in her friend's achievements. Now, what I would add to that definition a little bit that's more, more enriched biblically is that not only are you living your life through someone else, it's you're experiencing life through them, an actual participation. So it's not just uh, living from afar, but you really want to be in that person, living your life in them. Sometimes, maybe unhealthily, you might hear people say, I'm living my life vicariously through my children. They get to enjoy things that I never got to enjoy. They're experiencing things I never got to experience as a child. So I am vicariously living through them. Now, if we could take that word and understand that Jesus is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God among us, he shares in our humanity so that we can vicariously experience his humanity and his divinity. That's why God became human. He becomes one of us, Emmanuel, God among us. Here's some scriptures that really bring this out. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, you are living now vicariously in Christ. The life I now, notice that, present tense, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, you are living vicariously in Jesus. That gives us the definition of faith as a discovering moment to moment my life vicariously lived in Jesus Christ my Lord. That's what faith is. Your faith is discovering each and waking moment of your life. What it means to be alive in Jesus Christ. Every day of every moment, you're discovering, not earning, but discovering. How do I live? What is this life I am living vicariously now in Jesus Christ? Paul put it again this way in Colossians. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life, notice past tense, you died, past, and your life is now, presently, hidden with Christ in God. You are now living vicariously in Jesus Christ. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When he comes and you see him fully, you will see yourself fully. You will discover yourself fully as you have been vicariously living now in Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to have a hard time sometimes doing that fully and experiencing that fully, but we can experience it now. It can be experienced more and more. The more we choose to live vicariously in Him, we can experience this great joy. You hear it again in Paul's words in Romans when he says, We were therefore buried with Him vicariously through baptism into death. Vicariously, you have participated in his death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live vicariously a new life. For if we have been united vicariously with him in his death like his, we will certainly also be united vicariously with him in a resurrection like his. You are vicariously participating 
in Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and life. That means your baptism contributes nothing to your salvation. Jesus' baptism achieves everything. You experience the joy of Jesus' baptism vicariously. So it's not how well you were baptized, how good you were baptized, even for the right reasons. Do you understand that vicariously you're baptized into Jesus' baptism? What was his baptism like? Well, when he came to John the Baptist to be baptized in the Jordan River, John said to him, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? And then he says these amazing words. Right? He, he tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. In other words, for you to experience vicariously his baptism, he had to do this as a human being. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now think back to Romans 6. You have been united with Christ in his death through baptism vicariously. You've been raised with him vicariously. You live with him now on the throne of God vicariously. That means when you are baptized, by faith you discover that you are vicariously participating in Christ's baptism. What does God say to you when you are baptized? You should hear these words in your heart. You are my child whom I love with you. I am well pleased. This is the road to confident assurance in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I would like you to do an exercise this week if you're willing to try it. When you have a moment of quiet, maybe in the morning, maybe late in the evening, maybe do it both times, once in the morning, once in the evening. I want you to sit quietly. And before, as you sit there and, and, and quiet your thoughts, I want you to read Colossians 1, or excuse me, Colossians 3 again. And read the verse where he highlights, your life is now hidden in Christ. And think about how you participate vicariously in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And now you are on that throne. And if you can, imagine yourself hearing Jesus' words. You are my child, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And just feel what it's like to hear the Father say those words to you. Because the truth is, by faith, vicariously, that is exactly what God is saying to you. And if you know in your heart that God is saying to you, you are my child, I love you, I am well pleased, you'll never doubt your salvation, but always have confidence in your assurance in Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean about your, your role in this, and your response to the gospel, and your, what does it mean to live the Christian life, and what, how does that play into all this? The answer is this. I'll tell you next week in next week's worship night. But until then, live vicariously and joyfully in Jesus Christ.